Welcome to this press conference at the Royal Academy of Sciences. Um, the Academy met this morning in session and took its decision regarding the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And we are now ready to announce it. And as usual, we'll go between the languages. Uh, my name is Jaran Hansen, I'm the Secretary General of the Academy. And with me on the podium is, on my right, Professor Sara snogerup Linse, the Chairman of the Nobel Committee for Chemistry. And on my left, Professor Peter Brzezinski, who is a member of the Nobel Committee and an expert in the area that is being awarded this year. And later on, we hope that one of our new Nobel laureates will be with us on the phone line. Now, this year's prize is about a cool method for imaging the molecules of life. Årets pris handlar om en cool method för att avbilda livets molekyler. Kungliga vetenskapsakademin har beslutat att utdela 2017 års Nobelpris i kemi till Jacques Dubochet, Joachim Frank och Richard Henderson. Och akademins motivering lyder för utveckling av kryoelektronmikroskopi för högupplösande strukturbestämning av biomolekyler i lösning. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry jointly to Jacques Dubochet, Joachim Frank and Richard Henderson. And the Academy citation runs for developing cryo-electron microscopy for the high resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution. Für die Entwicklung der Kryoelektronenmikroskopie für die hochauflösende Strukturbestimmung von Biomolekülen in Lösung. Pour développement de la cryomicroscopie électronique pour la détermination haute résolution de la structure des biomolécules en solution. Zarazvitie cryoelektronoimikroskopie visokova razrešenja dia predeljenja strukturi biomolekul varastvore. And you see pictures of our new Nobel laureates on the screen above me. Jacques Dubourget was born in 1942 in Switzerland. He studied in Basel and in Geneva, and he's currently honorary professor at the Université de Lausanne in Switzerland. He's a Swiss citizen. Joachim Frank was born in 1940 in Germany. He got his PhD at the Technical University in Munich, München, and he's currently a professor at Columbia University in New York. He is nowadays a uh, US citizen. And last but not least, Richard Henderson was born in 1945 in Scotland. He received his PhD at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom, and he is since many years at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, and I think he is the 15th Nobel laureate from that laboratory. Rather impressive. With that, I'll give the word to the chairman of the Nobel Committee, Sara Snogerup Linse. She'll provide a brief summary of the research that's been awarded today. Sara, please. Thank you, Jaren. We are made of more water than anything else. Biomolecules, the molecules of life, they do their job in water. So let's put them there. Now they are free to move and act and interact and do their job together to help us execute important functions like thinking and carrying around stuff. Every protein in here is roughly 10 nanometers in diameter. So if I were to reverse this process and pull out one million of them and put them along one line, they would cover just a centimeter. Cryo-EM is able to see each and every one of these protein molecules. And it can do much better than so. It can see each and every atom inside each protein to tell us how they are arranged to build up their intricate structures. It can do even better than so. It can show us how 
the different parts of the protein moves relative to one another when they execute their jobs. Richard Henderson showed the first protein structure at atomic resolution using cryo-electron microscopy. Jacques Dubuchet developed a method to take these samples of biomolecules in water and freeze them so rapidly that they formed a thin film in which the water was preserved in a liquid state, just like in a glass window. Joachim Frank developed a method to combine the information from multiple blurry images of those individual proteins into one sharp image. Soon there are no more secrets. Now we can see the intricate details of the biomolecules in every corner of our cells, in every drop of our body fluids. We can understand how they are built and how they act and how they work together in large communities. We are facing a revolution in biochemistry. Thank you, Sara, for that great introduction. <coughs> now, Peter, can you show us perhaps what those molecules in the glass look like? Oh, I'll try. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> uh, so this picture <coughs> shows uh, three examples of uh, structures that have been determined using the technique uh, that uh, has been developed by the laureate. And uh, the first one on the left side is a biological clock. It's a protein complex which controls the time in many living organisms. And, and this is closely related to the prize for physiology or medicine that we could hear about a couple of days ago. In the middle, it's a pressure sensor. Or it's of the type that is used, for example, in our ear to convert the sound waves into electrical signals. Uh, on the right side, it's a huge protein complex that is uh, used by salmonella bacteria to inject harmful substances into the host. This is the host and this is the bacterium itself. And these structures have been determined using the techniques developed by the laureates, which have opened up a completely new world to us to be able to see all these molecules inside the cell and how they interact. The challenge is that these molecules are very small. The size relation of a molecule, like the one I showed, to a human being is approximately the same as of a human being to the size of the moon. We currently don't have any instrument that would allow us to see a human being on the moon from the surface of our planet. But we do have an instrument which allows us now to see the molecules inside our cells. And not even that, we can even see the atoms that build up these molecules and see the details of all these molecules. Uh, the electron microscope is not a new instrument. It was developed almost 100 years ago. Uh, the problem is that there is a great challenge in studying biological objects using electron microscopy because there must be vacuum inside the electron microscope. And biological objects are composed primarily of water. And if you place an water, a object containing water in a vacuum, it dries and the structure changes. If you switch on the electron beam then, the object is burned and the structure does not even remind us about the original object. Richard Henderson studied an, orga an, uh, uh, an organism or a protein from an organism that lives in salt ponds like the one shown here in the desert. Uh, this is a microorganism which carries patches of photosynthetic proteins on its surface. And these proteins, they are arranged in uh, regular arrays that uh, contain many, many of these molecules. And Richard Henderson placed these <coughs> patches in the electron microscope and uh, by observing about 5 million of these uh, uh, bacteriopsin molecules at the same time, he could distribute the, the electron radiation over a large number of molecules so that each, of, each one of them did not receive enough electron radiation that would damage them, but he could then study the molecules. 
And in this way, he could uh, obtain a high resolution structure of the protein of bacterial rhodopsin. But this is a special case. Not all molecules are oriented like in, in this case, in this microorganism. Most molecules are free or f uh, like Sarah showed in water. And Richard Henson believed that the technique uh, could be also used to study essentially any molecule that is found in the cell. Uh, when we study a picture of molecules that are in solution, and this is an example <coughs> of a ribosome that we see in solution here, the, all the molecules are randomly distributed in the solution. So they are difficult to find. So the challenge is now to do, using this very low, low electron radiation that would not damage the molecules to actually see them and see where they are. Then we have to see how are they oriented relative to each other. Because we must know in order to determine the three-dimensional structure to, to, to combine all these pictures into the whole structure. Joachim Frank developed these methods and it's illustrated in <coughs> this schematic illustration. So here are the molecules <coughs> in solution. They have different orientation. Uh, when these molecules are illuminated by the electron beam, we see projections of these molecules, like shadows of these molecules. And these shadows differ in shape depending on the orientation of the object that was illuminated. This can be now sorted, uh, those that have the same shape or originate from molecules with the same orientation are sorted in groups. <coughs> and then an average of all these pictures can be taken in each of these groups. And in this way, one can obtain sharper pictures. One can increase the signal relative to the background noise. And this is the way now to obtain better resolution pictures. Then these pictures can be combined to build a three-dimensional structure. And this is an example of such a structure. But in order now to, to obtain information about the details, about the atoms, what the, what the molecule looks like inside, better sample preparation methods were needed. And many people believed that the way to prepare samples was to would be to freeze them. The problem is that if you place a biological object in ice, in, uh, in, in water and freeze, then ice crystals are formed around the object. And the ice crystals diffract the electron beam. So when it's illuminated, all the in information is lost because the ice crystals diffract the, the electron beam. But uh, people also believe that it would be possible perhaps to freeze the uh, sample fast enough so that the water would not have time to arrange itself into crystals to form ice, but would be a structure that is, is like a liquid. All the water molecules are randomly distributed and not, not forming the ice crystals. And if this is the case, then it would be possible to obtain a sharp picture because all the electron beams would be evenly absorbed by the, by the this vitrified water, as it's called. And in this way, Jacques de Boucher could uh, develop the technique that allowed to see biomolecules uh, at good contrast. The method is described in this picture. So the, the sample is applied to a grid, <coughs> and the, the, uh, the sample then in water is, spans the, the, the distance across this, the holes in this grid. And <coughs> Then the sample is frozen in uh, ethane that is cooled by liquid nitrogen. So the temperature is about mi minus 190 degrees. It's rapidly frozen and then the glass is formed. The water in a glass form is, form is formed across the, these holes. This is a setup that was built by Jacques de Boucher. And we see here it's like a catapult that is used to to inject the sample that is here into the cold ethane here. So it's frozen very rapidly in order to form this vitrified state. And using this method, Jacques de Boucher, in the beginning of 1980, he showed these beautiful pictures, like in this case of a virus. And everyone traveled to, who were working in this field traveled to his, his lab to, in order to learn the technique. And uh, it was then rapidly used by many other, in uh, many other laboratories. The technique has transformed the electron microscopy from a technique that 
could be used to just see the shapes, the outer shapes of, of molecules into one that is now used to see the details, the atoms inside the molecules. <coughs> and the latest the technical developments occurred very recently. So it's very recent developments that we can actually see the details of, of these molecules. Uh, the technique is also relatively rapid, so once one has samples that can be studied, uh, the structure can be determined relatively rapidly, and this was exemplified uh, in last year <coughs> when the structure of the Zika virus was determined in just a few months, and it's seen here. And this structure shows the atomic details of the surface, which of course is important when uh, developing drugs against the virus. <coughs> Uh, but the technique is not only about seeing molecules, and I think this is a f f fantastic for, for uh, developments that will has already started, but will be seen also in the future. And that is because the molecules are frozen in solution. Each, if a molecule does some work, like the one shown here, then all these molecules are frozen in exactly in the moment, in the different states, in different structures, and it's like frames of a movie. Each, each of these pictures represents a frame, and they can be put together into a movie like the one shown here, uh, and we can see what the molecules do. So I think in the future, this is not only about getting structures of molecules, which are in itself is of course fantastic, but it's also for the future, we'll be able to see processes, what is happening, what is going on inside uh, the cells, how do the molecules interact, how do they move, what do they do. And I end this presentation by showing the laureates again. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Peter, for that beautiful and exciting presentation. Now, uh, I hope we have Professor Joachim Frank with us on the phone. Dr. Frank, are you there? Hello. Here. Yes, hello. Um, and thanks for being with us. Uh, this is Joran Hansen, who I believe woke you up an hour ago or so. Didn't mind. <laughs> Good. Um, now, I, I'm in the session hall of the Academy and we have journalists from Sweden and all over the world here. Um, and I'm sure they have questions to ask you. Who would like to start? Thomas von Heine, as usual, please. Uh, good morning, Professor. This is Swedish television. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, we just heard some of the uh, something about the usefulness of your technique or your technology. Could you, in, in your words, what, what's, what, what would be the, the main usefulness of it? Well, um, <coughs> structure, uh, structure research um, has been mainly done with X crystallography for the past decades, and um, uh, X ray crystallography. Uh, requires uh, molecules to be arranged uh, very rigidly in, in crystals, so it can, it's not applicable to all molecules. Also, molecules go through many different states, and not all these states can be captured by X-ray photography. So, so the uh, <clears throat> cryo-electron microscopy of single particles uh, fills an important gap uh, it extends the range of molecules that can be um, determined at, at atomic resolution. And it also makes it possible to uh, see these molecules in, in the functional states that are relevant for, uh, for, uh, for the life functions. Do you see any immediate practical use? I think that's an interest for our journalists here. Well, the, the practical use is immense, uh, but there's always uh, a, a long time uh, between uh, the results of fundamental research to make their way uh, into the general knowledge and, and uh, the practice of medicine. Mm. Uh, and you might know that, that uh, the X-ray crystallography um, uh, during uh, the uh, the past uh, maybe five decades has resulted in 100,000 structures that are all publicly available. And they now form the uh, fundaments of uh, molecular medicine. 
medicine is no longer uh, looking at organs, but shows it, it, it looks really at the processes in the cell. And that's how um, medicine has become so powerful. And the same transformation uh, it, it will happen with, with all the results that are obtained by cryo-electromicroscopy. It is just not an immediate peptide application, but, but uh, several years to go, <coughs> go by uh, before the practical use is seen. Exactly. We have a question over there from lady over there. Hi, from I'm Annalie Megner Arn from Swedish TV4. Congratulations. I wonder which one is the coolest mo uh, molecule you have seen through your microscope? Well, for me, uh, I've been <coughs> I've been looking at ribosomes for <laughs> a, a big part of my life, and for me, the coolest molecule is always in the ribosome. Uh, and uh, so the recent, um, the recent revolution uh, that has been produced by the <coughs> development of the very sensitive cameras uh, has resulted now in, in natural images of the ribosome that, uh, is, um, that are in incredible in terms of um, uh, understanding the functions. Uh, we can now see how the ribosome uh, can can uh, distinguish between uh, the correct and the incorrect uh, uh, pairing of an undercoder, meaning the decoding, the essential process that takes place in the ribosome, can now be explained in uh, in atomic detail. L let me. Um Right. We have some slight pro problems with the connection, so I'll just mention the ribosome, the, pro the machinery that makes proteins in the cell, uh, is the most remarkable structure for, for Dr. Frank himself. Uh, and you can see even the details uh, when the amino acids are put together now. Uh, so that's what's uh, thrilling for Dr. Frank. Uh, we have one more question over there. Yes, uh, we were told at the press conference that uh, the Zika virus was uh, analyzed using your method. Could you please elaborate a little bit about uh, that specific application? Were you involved in that at all? Um, I, I was not involved in this. This was done by uh, Michael Rossman at Purdue University. And um, actually, the reconstruction of viruses uh, have, a, have a great advantage over the <coughs> reconstruction of uh, molecules without symmetry uh, because a single view uh, gives you uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, but in the case of this particular symmetry, it gives you uh, 60 views and, and so you have many more um, information just from a single view. The methods that I developed um, are, uh, were not uh, so uh, important for the development of, um, uh, for, uh, for the reconstruction of the virus. But they were a start of something very important, weren't they? We have a question yes. over here. Uh, thank you. David Keaton from the Associated Press. Um, a question in two parts, if I may. First of all, sir, how did you react? What was the Im first impression when you received the phone call this morning announcing this prize? And uh, the second part is, uh, over the last few days, the Nobel Prizes that we have heard uh, that have been announced, the, sort of the importance of the technological innovation and breakthrough um, was stressed several times the importance of that technological breakthrough that enabled the scientific discoveries. Do you believe that in this era today of, in scientific research that the, the sort of the technology is sort of paramount and actually maybe the first step before the actual um, fundamental science discoveries? Okay. Um, well, as, as to the first uh, question, uh, I, I, was, uh, I was fully overwhelmed. Uh, I, I thought the chances of uh, and a Nobel Prize are, are minuscule uh, because there are so many, so many other uh, <coughs> innovations and, and discoveries uh, that happen 
almost every day. Uh, so, so yeah, I was um, I, I was in in a way speechless, and I only, only said this is wonderful news, and I repeated myself. So. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as to the second question, um, I, I I I think I think uh, the, the Nobel Committee uh, or the Nobel Committees always have this. Uh, <clears throat> They have this <clears throat> quandary of deciding whether uh, a fundamental uh, <clears throat> breakthrough is worth the price or a, techn a technological innovation. Uh, technological in innovations, in my mind, have, have much larger impact. Cryo-electron microscopy is about to completely transform uh, structural biology. And, and uh, which can be seen from the fact that uh, crystallographers uh, flock to the conferences in cryoEM, and there are also uh, many applications by postdocs um, uh, for postdoc position of uh, students that have been trained in crystallography. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I I do think that um, deciding between a, a, a particular discovery and uh, and a technological break, uh, breakthrough. It's uh, I, I would always think that the, the impact uh, is probably much larger uh, you know, for the uh, <coughs> uh, technological breakthrough. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think. We'll have to stop there. And uh, um, thank you very much for being with us, Professor Frank. And we look forward to welcoming you to Stockholm in December. Thank you very much. And I, bye bye. I now. very much look forward to that. Yeah. Now, are there questions for the panel? Uh, yes, please. Shinji Axel. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Sufit and Axel Song from uh, Freelance for China Radio. Uh, so far, we have s nine laureates and uh, about seven is from the USA. So I just uh, like to ask you to have a comment about this. Uh, is it how, how do you comment the research environment or policies in the US, or why it's like this? Yeah. Thank you. Well, if I'll start, and maybe my colleagues can uh, uh, expand. Uh, the United States has, since the second, after the Second World War, allowed scientists to perform fundamental research, um, to focus on important questions in science, not forcing them to immediate applications, not controlling them in a political way. And that freedom, combined with very good resources, have been very helpful for the United States. But it's not unique to the United States. As I mentioned, Richard Henderson is at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, the LMB in Cambridge, UK, uh, that has fostered a whole long list of Nobel laureates because of the intellectual atmosphere, because of, of resources for um, basic research that has turned out to pay off in practical applications later on, but they are not pushing them to try to solve immediate practical problems, but to lay the foundation for that. And I think that has been very helpful. In other parts of the world, of course, they have been less privileged. The situation has been very different. We've had colonialism, we've had wars and so on. It's been very difficult to, to mobilize enough resources for science. But it's also a matter of the uh, intellectual climate allowed uh, in the universities. Sara, would you like perhaps to add on that? Yeah. What I could add, I mean, of course, the academic freedom, I think, is the, the key to making big discoveries. Um, but what we can do uh, as Nobel committees is that we invite universities and individual scientists from all over the world to nominate. That's how we work to get in nominations from the whole world. Mm. That's an important point. We really give opportunities to scientists in, on every continent and in most countries to nominate. We, we make some efforts to give that opportunity. 
more questions? Please, gentleman over there. Uh, yes, uh, it's Yiming Fu from China's National Xinhua News Agency. Uh, it seems to me that this year's discovery uh, is a combination of physics and chemistry. You know, we're talking about uh, micros microscopy, uh, light and imaging, as well as the molecule structures. So can you tell us how important it is for this interdisciplinary methods in research of chemistry in future? Thank you. Peter, would you like to uh, yeah. comment on that? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a very good example of how, how contacts between scientists in different disciplines is and I think it's uh, the discipline, the, the development is such that the discipline mix more and more I think and uh, as you correctly pointed out I mean this is a particular good example where, where both uh, technical developments and, and uh, methods, mathematical tools have been developed and also preparation techniques uh, so I, I think this t t works to together the dis different disciplines, different backgrounds of scientists work together to, to develop t uh, techniques like in this example. Thank you. More questions? Mm -hmm. If not, then uh, we'll close this part of the press conference mm -hmm. and those of you who have requested interviews, uh, you will have that opportunity in a minute or so. Thank you very much. <laughs>